Hey y'all, I'm your host Shift, and I'm here with Beck and Ryan to explore the notion that it's possible white fragility might be a personality disorder. And while we are all armchair psychologists, we do actually know what the fuck we're talking about. So, uh, you know, get ready for some absolutely wild discourse because we go hard on this topic. Uh, welcome. Word, how's your night? How's everything? Uh, I just sent a thousand dollars to a stranger for an Airbnb. Oh. Oh, yeah, <laughs> nice. I'm a little nervous. <laughs> oh, a little nervous. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, you know, you're getting back. You're getting back into the direct action game, and you are like an extreme player when you do it. <laughs> I know. Uh, Remember that time you dropped seven hundred dollars to bail my ex out of a thing, and then forgot about it. Mm-hmm. I think it's funny that you remember that you forgot about it. Mm-hmm. Would if I if I wanted to keep that in? Would you want me to keep that in? That's no, relevant. It certainly is because that's the work. Shit. The, that's the work. That is the work. That's the work. It's the antithesis to the answer of the question that we're asking today, which is, is white fragility a personality disorder? It may be resistant to change, but it's not impossible to change. It's not impossible. Is it in some instances? Uh, well, like, yeah, I'm sure, like, probability-wise, like, you know, on certain percent of the population, it's just not possible, And but for some percent, it is, and you don't know who you're dealing with until, like, you find out. So how do we know, I guess? I mean, how do we know without... I don't know. Without letting <laughs> whiteness fuck everything up? Like, how do we know? I don't know. People took a chance on me to get me as, like, far along in my processing as I am, and people were harmed in the way, for sure. Ah, fair enough. People kept, like, opening their hearts back up. But yeah, um, I mean, I think Mm. a lot of times people just give up, like there's too much ego on the line and they're like, you know, getting called out or whatever is embarrassing and shameful. And you just get so caught up in your ego and your white fragility and your white guilt. And you're just like, oh, I'm such a bad person. I'm such a shit person. I just got to protect everybody from myself and hide away. And, um, but Mm. you just keep coming back and like trying again and trying really hard not to harm anybody during the process, trying to apply the lessons you learned last fucking time Uh, (laughs) uh, and try not to do those same mistakes again. A lot of times you do and like, but keep taking it on the chin as you said yesterday. And um, like, just, I sure did. It's not about us. It's not about me. It's not about my, um, like feelings. It's about the goddamn problem of ending white supremacy and uh, everything that goes along with it. And so that was a big realization that just came to me in stages, like, because I was graced with it by people who told it to me like multiple times. And, um, you know, I was able to receive it deeper each time and like, I'm continuing to process that and, and, um, implement that in my life. But it, it takes a lot of confidence. Like I have to know that I'm an okay person and that I, my world doesn't shatter. And if I could admit that I can have done and will do and continue to do great harm from a position of privilege, you just can't help but cut swaths of, of harm through the world because you, there's just a lot of ways that you don't have experience of, with thinking about how uh, you interact with other people um, and let's pause on, let's, let's stop there because yeah. that's one of those things that people get to, they get to like misinterpret it yeah. to the end of bailing out of accountability. It like yeah. it backfires altogether, you know? Yeah. Yeah. You don't get permission to, ju- it's not okay to just like carve swaths of harm, but it's going to be stuff that happens um, inevitably, but it doesn't, it's not okay at the same time. And you have to make it be accountable for it. And you have to uh, find ways like financially or, and uh, if you have the means and um, I've, one thing I've learned as a white person who can mask and go into the world and, 
uh, get good amounts of money that it's part of my responsibility in a lot of ways to go access the material like capital that I can and bring it back because that's something that not a lot of my comrades and community is able to go get because of a lot of systemic and, and structural barriers and obstacles and, and shit that gets thrown up in the way. But um, I can go get that shit and help bring it back. That's uh, and be, and be accountable, actually, you know, have the resources to be accountable for the things that that I do um, financially uh, and also go get therapy and, and self care and figure my personal development out so that I can be accountable emotionally for the things that I do. It's my responsibility to go do those things. You missed one, Uh, one big one. And it's one that people can access like with or without resources uh, external resources if they have the capacity internally, but you participate in white nonsense roundups. Like, yeah, like doing the work to, to help like solve the problem and make it better. And, right. Yeah. Yeah. Communicate. Yeah. You do facilitate. I mean, generally you'll do kind of high octane community facilitation, but you specifically will take on white bullshit in some unconventional ways, according to what people expect socially. I get like in trouble. (laughs) Yes. Let's talk about that. Let's talk about that. Oh, it's hard, man, um, to keep going back to it. But I keep trying to make marshal my spiritual resources and like develop that spiritual armor that you talk about and be able back in there but like i don't know i find like a lot of other my uh fellow white anti-racist activist folks when they're calling out like white nonsense on social media and stuff they just tend to like molly coddle and um and just really soft like hand dull like this you know, horrifying things that people are doing and like saying things like, you know, just something to consider. Have you thought about it this way? Um, I thought Mm. I think what you Mm. think, but now I read about this horrible fact. And now I think this other thing, just something to consider. Um, (laughs) conversation that I had, like, this is literally a conversation I had with somebody a few months ago, um, with, a uh, like a white liberal, like former coworker and a, and a friend. And, um, and she was talking about success she had had with, uh, like other white people using this approach. And I was like, yeah, but you're not really like, you're kind of doing a disservice to the depth and severity of the issue at hand. It's not something to consider like, you know, this is genocide and lives and all this, you know, blood on at stake. And, um, like sometimes I, I coming from my heart, I just feel like you have to shake people up sometimes. And a lot of times it's not even for the person that you're talking to when you're pointing out mm. the, the horrific like nature of what they're saying and what's implied by what they're saying. But it might be other people that are reading it and scanning it. And a lot of times, you know, I've been called like, Oh, I'm being, you know, abusive or I've never been talked to that way before in my life or whatever. And I'm not even saying mm-hmm. ridiculous out there stuff. I'm, you know, I'm just, like what what kind of shit sets people off like that like uh the comment that set off i've never been talked to that way this way before in my life was like um somebody who was it, there was the little was a little white boy that was murdered by the black man this past summer and and it became this symbol of of anti blm um do you remember the the, the situation I, did you hear about this Ryan? What? Where was I? Uh, when was this? I can't believe you missed it. It was all over for a few minutes at, right after BLM started when? off again. Oh, this little white boy that was like murdered, and they caught the the guy like right away and like put him in jail, of course. And but then all of the the right wingers and the Trumpers started coming out and saying like, "Look, nobody cares about this little white boy that was killed. No, white lives not matter. Does Caden's life not matter, or whatever his you know, name was? This poor kid, you know, becomes." symbol for white supremacy <laughs> yeah they got they got really excited because they had uh, a name to shout back 
like a picture of like a tragic case. And it was just like, it was just ridiculous. And I woke up and saw some like white lady from my hometown that I had grown up commenting a story that was like, you know, poor so-and-so, poor little kid. Um, doesn't his life matter too or whatever? And I kind of jumped on. I was like, wow, this is racist because of such and such. Like, don't, this is, I just kind of like stated it very neutrally and bluntly. Um, and then I like just kind of left it. And then I saw another post that come up a little bit later of saying the same type of thing, like doubling down on it. And ooh, that kind of like, I, I think I t- tagged her in something else that said, Oh, is this the kind of nonsense that you're on this morning? Or do you have that? You really have that hate in your heart, don't you? Question mark. And my whole hometown came after me. <laughs> and, I, <laughs> and like, you're so mean. Her, and now you, you're the crazy one. You're the racist one. The stuff they always like go to uh, trying to because you put her on on some bullshit. You're like, it's like it's when like, you do it in public, you have this and, meltdown. Oh, fuck. Yeah, she like, should be embarrassed. Yeah, she should be embarrassed. That was some racist, awful stuff. Um, and apparently she's just kind of like, didn't really know any better. It's just radically awesome. Um, but that doesn't make it okay. And it doesn't make it okay that you've never been taught to that way in your life before. I didn't say anything that ridiculous. I was a little bit right. sick. And I'm <laughs> like, fuck, man. Like, that is the kind of stuff. Yeah, like, usually, I mean, I'll just be kind of neutral to a little bit like sassy or sarcastic, like nothing (laughs) like just ridiculous, nothing super. I mean, and sometimes, okay. So there was another situation, a couple that I had gone to college with. Um, and the woman's mom, it's like a, this kind of school teacher type middle Kentucky type who was, pearl clutching about BLM protesters and, and, you know, window smashing or something along that lines, I'm sure. And just, you know, you just can't Ooh, fuck it through. Yeah. listen to anybody that would, uh, you know, that that's how they would express themselves. And I raised my children to be good people and you just don't do that kind of thing. And good people never break glass ever. Their ceilings are made out of them. It's important that they not break any glass. Yeah, you just, you're not supposed to, you know, rock the boat or, you know, do anything scary. And, um, and she just couldn't wrap her brain around that, like, that could just ever be excusable for any reason. Like, just, you know, that's just beyond the pale, um, which is this pearl clutching stuff that'll, and at that moment, I was kind of trying to share a lot of these memes that were like, with that MLK quote talking about the white liberals being the, the biggest enemy and, um, and, and other things along those lines from like black protesters kind of talking about how uh, how frustrating it was that, um, you know, white people were only approving of the good type of black protesters and not the, the bad type of black protesters. And I was like mm-hmm. um, telling her, you know, like, do you understand that the a window versus like, this, you know, 400 years of the worst genocide that the world has ever seen and like just the the scope and scale and just how ridiculous this comparison is. And I was, you know, I was saying about calling, I was using words like absurd. Um, and she, I, I took, I, I sat down and took, I don't know, an hour or two and wrote, paragraphs and like two pages of response to this woman. And I put it up. Mm. Um, that was after like a good, you know, a few paragraph response that she was like receiving to. And then, but, and like, but prodding a little probing a little bit more. And so I was like, okay, let me just explain the full, let me just, let me just give it to you from my heart. Everything I know, woman, here is a gift for all the shit I've learned from listening to the pain of black suffering and death for the last mm what, 10 years. Um, and, uh, and I, I felt like you know, I was shaking, you know, and, and she turns around and, and says, she never wants to talk to me again. And I was abusive and that, how could I talk? She's never, you know, this kind of, I've never been spoken to that way. How dare you speak to me that way? Pearl clutchy. Like mm-hmm. I couldn't, I was shook. Like, you know, it took me a little that I needed to talk to a mutual friend who would kind of observed it and like process around that. Um, is it's just, oh. they never appreciate that. The, the deeper you dig when they're like, don't, 
tell me about this at all. The deeper you get into your lived experience, it's like when you go and you go all in, they go all out. They really don't want to hear it and then make it your problem for laying it on them. Like Exactly. I mean, yeah, no, I just got called abusive mm -hmm. in public because I was essentially doing the same thing you just described where I was mm -hmm. like, this is an issue. It's like, it's not private stuff and it needs to be yeah. discussed. And I'm yeah. not interested in doing it in a vacuum because it's been abusive anytime it's been in a vacuum to me. Like, you know, and so I'm like, let's discuss this with memes that are posted. And like, mm -hmm. we don't have to do the whole conversation there, but I'm going to make this comment in public and I'm going to, I'm going to tag you in it. Mm -hmm. And yeah. yeah, people act like that's the, like for real, this person was like, I would never put any effort into a person that would talk to me this way on Twitter. Like Twitter's some sanctuary. Mm -hmm. Like, do you understand the dragging of black Twitter? <laughs> like, I mean, that's the thing. Like, like, the I'm, like, I'm an internet personality and I have yeah, ever a couple of years. That, like, I, I don't have a huge following, but I have a very charged following, for fuck's sake. So, um, I'm sure it was lightweight versus, you know, what could have come that person's way. Like... It was nothing. It was literally, it was I mean, I won't say it was nothing. I was mean, but I was right. Oh, so <laughs> like there's a, there's a mean is really relative. Mean is really it's relative. super relative. Um, really relative. It's especially relative when you're dealing with like a person that you're dealing with, like you're targeting with information. They're like, you're attacking me. And I'm like, no, you're like, mm -hmm. You're like a data it, point. Like you need to understand some fact. things and I'm going to get this information to you. And I don't have sugar to coat it in for your bitch ass. I don't have that. Like, and it's not even necessarily good to coat it in it. If you do have it, that's what I'm kind of. Right. Having. It messes with the medicine sometimes. It's people need to hear it deep and hard and it needs to wake you up on some level. Like I got reamed so many times and you just have to keep rolling and coming back and you have to let go of your ego. And it's not about us. It's not about me. What's the problem? How, what, what am I doing here? How can I do better? How, what's the big problem that I can help solve? How would, can I, what do I have leverage to, to use? Um, and just stop fearing so much. And that's what I've seen from the white radical community versus the radical communities of color that I've seen a lot more of is just mm -hmm. like, just the, the urgency and the, and the, um, and the prioritization, the proper prioritization of concerns and the just, the ability to move past fear and n not get caught up on the individual ego um, versus, you know, this white fragility and white guilt stuff that just, just sags and weighs us down heavily. I mean, we're just so, so afraid of being called racist. And let me dig into that a little bit and explain like partly what that's about um, is, uh, I mean, in part, something I, I think people don't necessarily understand is part of my struggle with it was that I feel like it makes me less of a good voice for change because then all the the really ignorant folks over here who are trying to who are just starting to get the message now think I'm just another racist white person. And why should they listen to me? I've got nothing to say. They don't know how to discern like <laughs> Oh, interesting. You know, like now I get labeled a racist white person and I lose all my social capital to attack white supremacy. This is a little bit similar. It's very different, but it's a little bit similar to my concerns about having coon media producers running all over Hollywood, making big content that like white people eat up. You know, it's a similar kind of like... There's this like, there's this like world of anxieties that's manifested by trying to do things perfectly. Yeah. Like trying to pick the right things to consume, like the right, you know, yes. like who to spend yes. your money on, who to pay attention to, who to, who to put on and promote other people, give their attention to. That's what happens when we're force fed trash. 
though. You know, it's like you got to kind of comb through stuff, and that's where we learn media literacy. But, like, managing that anxiety is, like, a big deal thing that needs to be, like, we need more space for that in the world. I mean, like, AA. AA is everywhere. Everybody knows where to find their local AA meetings. It's this prevalent of a, of a cultural disease. Like white anti-racist groups was kind of a thing that was booming a little bit starting a few years ago. Um, but then there came a wave of criticism and it came around was like, wow, these white people are kind of messing it up and they're unchecked. Nobody's like supervising what kind of shit they're getting up to in these bunch of white people talking about white supremacy groups. Um, maybe sure. just way that this should be handled. And so I and other people I know just kind of stopped, like those groups just kind of died down. And I don't, I think there's, you know, right. still well, doing stuff, but they started thinking more about like how to make sure that they're accountable, uh, that they're being, you know, that they're, that they're doing things right. Um, I think there's a time and a place for different things. Like I was saying earlier this year in June, I heard a lot of white women that were like, let me put up the black block on my social media and then I'm not going to talk yeah. or I'm just going to lend my platform to other people exclusively. And then they would sidebar and say all the right shit that needed to be publicly said. And I had to tell all these people, I was like, would you please go make videos, comment that shit. Like, don't, you don't get to take a vow of silence through June and July right now. Yeah. That like, that, that was a big, like, what they call, you know, the virtue signaling and the performative allyship and a, like, right. Like, let me go. It's, it's, let me go have immediate ally fatigue under the guise of community care and doing the right thing. And like, yeah. it was like the, the opportunity to put that black square came up and people took that as an exit. Uh, I didn't realize that I'm doing the work. That's where I felt I went, I experienced it a different way where I was like shamed into showing my face back up. Cause my first, like, I don't know, third post back up or something was like, you know, Hey y'all, sorry. I've been away, but like, uh, here I am. I had some babies. White silence is violence. <laughs> like, <laughs> you know, I'm here. <laughs> That's what's so, up. Uh, you know, yeah. I was getting reports on you. We weren't talking at the time. Oh yeah, I can guess who that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, but you can't. I got sp- I got spies all over the place. That's funny. That's, That's funny. Yeah, no, no, nobody knows where I get my information from. I get I got a bunch of people. I'll be like minding my own business, not thinking about somebody, and get calls on yeah. folks like randomly yeah. that I didn't I didn't ask for any of this ever. Yeah. Like it's, it's <laughs> so like anyway. I think where I was going though with the white um, groups was that I'm trying to think about where and how is good for white anti-racist folks to talk about these sort of things. And a lot of what I hear my radical friends of color talk about is like, make friends, like get to know people, um, actually know individual people and know, don't think of us as a big collective anonymous block of oh, Jesus. Yeah. Black people or, you know, whatever indigenous people, you know, like actually meet some people and make friends and hear it from their mouths. And I mean, the, obviously that's, I mean, that's been a big part of my path is when I started, you know, having a lot closer relationships with not just white people in my life and started, and especially with like activists of color and hearing about uh, about racism and the lived experience of it. And, you know, it was just really, you know, mind shattering. Um, but of course I am sure I said, uh, and I know I said a lot of really ignorant and hurtful and did a lot of hurtful and ignorant things during my unlearning process and still do. Um, and, and, but, and so I think sometimes, you know, I have questions about this or that, like, how do I not be, is this racist of me? How do I not do this? Can I, how do I be a better white person? But I've learned, we you know, a short list the other day. I know, but I have to also, I have to like throttle. I can't just lay, I like, I I can't take up all a bunch of emotional space with all my friends of color asking them all of this stuff about, you know, that's tokenizing and like pigeonholing people and making them representatives and making of their racial experience and making them relive racial trauma and like, explain and the frustration of explaining like 
white. I mean, you and I just did this what a day or two ago where you were like, I was like, please, can you just explain it to me? You're like, don't me explain this to you. No. <laughs> <laughs> and I was like, I yeah, well, we leave it and out of it. I don't, I can't learn. Oh, I can't learn if you don't tell me. <laughs> like, let me have yeah. it. <laughs> yeah. Well, and then the tricky part was I was, I was telling you at the time and then you panicked because you were like, you're coming too hard. And I was like, stop squirming or I'm going to kill you right now. And you stopped squirming immediately and we came back around and we worked it out. I don't, know. I don't think I even noticed that I was panicking. Maybe you sensed it in my voice and, and like. I mean, my- yeah, I, t- I assume that when people are like, I don't know when I have to be taught when I'm in the middle of teaching them that that's what's going on. I'm just going to call it that because that's what it feels like to me because I'm already done teaching you. So what's Mm -hmm. the, you know, Mm -hmm. and um, I I can be, uh, I can be a little loud. I can be a little loud. Um, (laughs) So, you know, I expect, I expect people to be like, shit, that's abrasive. And to need to have moments where I'm like, yeah, are you all right? I'm going to keep going. You need to leave. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I don't know. And I, I, you know, I tend to feel like you, you, you think you lay sharper, harsher, meaner blows than you do. And cause you like keep getting boxed in by these white suburban, like, like norms that don't make sense and are just super. It just blocked me for being not polite. About like genocide or like you know, yeah, excuse you, just horrible microaggressions that are happening all the time. Like tone policing, much like. <laughs> oh God! Well, I mean, I'm in a constant state of never knowing when the ground's going to drop out from under me because I surround myself with people who know how to talk the talk, and it's a matter of time before you find out if people know how to walk the walk or like how hard they trip when they are walking the walk and they trip. You got to be resilient and you got to keep walking the walk. And like, I don't know. I mean, I'm ashamed of sometimes how long it takes me to come back uh, after going away with my tail between my legs. Um, and there's spiritual injury. Wait, no, because it's real. It's real warfare and real injury does occur. And people do need to go take their space to process. And we don't always have somebody to help us like nurse back from these things. And I say us because like privilege like the rules of privilege engagement kind of are somewhat universal when you are dealing with somebody who's got a marginalization that you don't have. Mm -hmm. We're all human and it, I I have to go process and I have to like lick my wounds a little bit. And like it, a lot of times sleeping on it helps me. I find like the day of something I'm shook, but then I'll sleep on it. And the next day I'll be like, yeah, I'm yeah. All right. Whatever. Today's a new day. Like, I don't know. Um, but it, I, I've done a lot of self work and I, and I have a lot of confidence in myself and I'm just, um, have it just, you got to get fortitude in your gut to be able to let that stuff roll off. But it's also not, it's not just an, like an option. You can't, op, you're hurting people until you do. You, it's not, you can't just opt out. Like this is a, not like a job that you can just, choose to take on or not. And there's no judgment attached. Like this is the work that you have to do. Um, if you're, I have a theory privilege. that there, there's this like psych psychology, kind of like spiritual, like self-help brand called the work. And it's very, um, you know, uh, ally fatigue masquerading in the skin of self-care. Mm, yeah, 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 yeah. If it's applied here, that's what it would manifest yeah. as. I had an epiphany about it like a week ago mm. because somebody was saying I'm doing the work while mm. blocking me for calling them white when they were doing something I thought would be reasonable to call them white about. Um, white man it's a it's a thing yeah oh um yeah so the like yeah that is something i saw a lot in the um in the radical community in the white radical community was like just really relaxing into the well i'm just going to focus on healing for now like mm. Okay. Yeah. Go. uh, Yeah. We're trauma informed. We understand you got to go, you know, figure out some trauma and like, you know, fix yourself, like come back sturdier. But 
like I have seen myself and, and other people definitely like lean into that varying degrees of too hard. <laughs> like, yeah, it gets a little self-indulgent after a while. And I don't know, my guilt starts to eat at me. That's what happened this last time. I, I see all this like black lives matter stuff like going on again. And I'm just sitting around like not saying shit most days about anything about oppression and I'm just living my comfortable life. And like, yeah, I'm, you know, I've been doing some healing. I'm settled down and settling down from some trauma and cooling out and I had a you know a baby or two and <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, like, but I could, I felt like in my heart, I leaned into it, you know, too much. I was, I was getting some self-indulgency there. And I'm, I'm going to tend to agree with you. Uh, yeah, I'm sure. Yeah. I'm sure you were like, you know, one of the uh, primary people harmed by it. Um, and how? Yeah. And we'll be getting into yeah. that yeah. another time. Yeah, that's actually I do want to mention in the middle of all of this conversating, we did have a falling out. We were not talking for like a year. We've reconnected. And half, and yeah. Not directly addressed all the ins and outs of the whys and why fours of exactly why we stopped when we did with the talking. Um, <laughs> the reason I want to mention that is because, like, we both are really good at uh, being present and, like, dealing with what's at hand kind of shit. Like, that's just how we operate. And um, I just don't see that represented in, like, how relationship dynamics show up in any narratives that exist in the world. I don't, I just don't see it. Not except in my life, like except in my actual life. So I'm like, I got to produce things and actually like find like, there's, there's plenty of ways that I'm going to show this stuff. Like this weird way that I uh, curate relationships and then we're going to get into it. We're going to address it, Mm -hmm. but it doesn't impede the ability to, reform relationship and yeah, yeah we're, rebuilding. It's, we're not in we're not in denial about it or, or like putting it off either we address things when they need to come up cool. we're rebuilding your trust and rapport and we'll have a better conversation after we like get kind of close back up to each other more again like yeah that's what i think i mean that's i mean i would be happy to have a conversation about anything whenever anytime you want but like i, I totally am fine and see the point in, um, you know, in you wanting to just hold off on that for a, a minute. Sure. Okay. Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, and I, yeah, like, I don't know. I think I, I was really graced to have you open your heart back up to me and was, and I think it, it was, it, it was a little, t- tenser and it's less tense now it was tenser at first Indeed. i also agree with you about all of that shit yeah, yeah and- no, I, was, I was uh not open to that shit and it was a trepidatious re-entry on my own i think we're closer now i feel than i than we've ever been and you like were there for the birth of my two children and were a housemate and have been through uh many years of a lot of intense stuff with me and i think um just being able to come back together and um bring back, bring to the table now things that you, that I learned that that you told me during the process of when I was hurting you, um, that I never forgot about. And I've been, you know, working on trying to do better about, um, and, uh, I, like, gosh, what a chance to be a better person. What, what a great feeling. What a, what an amazing chance just that, that I've been given, um, and I feel so much closer to you now and that we've been able to support each other through this COVID situation, like almost you know, every day, <laughs> all day. <laughs> this is yeah, such kind a of kind of thing. yeah and, we didn't reconnect until kind of deep into the, you know, I guess looking at the whole thing as of now, like a little over halfway through. When we were yeah, just toward the latter ten of August, of September. Things the last few months, and it's been really good for me. I really needed that, but I, you know, I, I, I 
it's not can't say oh I deserved it where before where was that for me like I'm the one that that broke that and lost it and was fortunate enough to regain to regain it um so but yeah no I feel like it's cool because now like part of what you told me before was that I didn't tell my full truth to you before and I was bottling it up until and what I did was that I bottled it up until it was like too much. And then I cracked and was very mm. hurtful. And, um, but that I wasn't, that I wasn't being an authentic, fully real person with you and was, you know, holding back about, uh, about things. And, um, I'm trying not to do that now. And even if something I feel like might like hurt you or offend you, I'm trying to find a way that's like caring. I mean, I know, God, how to do this? You find a caring, loving way to ask a person to, about if they want to talk about such and such difficult topic and you present it in a loving and caring way. <laughs> like, and how? That's, we should write a book about it for dummies. That's all that'll be in it. Gosh. Well, oh, so, so, yeah, I mean, it, it really is just a world full of nuance and intersection and there's a lot more going on then, you know, I don't know. It's just people find easy opportunities to bail on shit. Like it's really, you know, we, we really did go through a whole number of things and, you know, it's all, it's all been logical. That's what I'll say for now. We'll get into the details of it in a whole other episode, because one thing that I want to get into is when one of the things that's been priority has been, uh, you've actually been doing a lot of, uh, energetic repayment for like the, what is the experience of stuff? And one of the thing you got, you got to breaking down. Um, I was having a hard time understanding the notion of how a motherfucker might be, uh, overtly marginalizing and horrible and then somehow find a way to play victim and, and do all kinds of weird projecting things. And I just couldn't do the math of all of this. And you, you did a few things to kind of like help me structure what the thought process of somebody mm. acting that way might be thinking. Mm. Uh, and one of the things that you brought up was like, like how do you love people when you're constantly trying to protect them from your privilege? Yes. Um, yeah. I mean, it's, it, in the last decade of my life or so, I've, I've kind of intentionally come into relationship with people from uh, a lot of positionalities that are with a lot less privilege than, than me um, and have really kind of had my eyes peeled open and come out of my lily white world to see some, some stuff and, but I bec because we were doing the same things and and had the same goals and rubbing up shoulders and living together and running in the streets together, became friends and um and you know here I am working side by side and living side by side with people who you know who you know I asked my partner how many of your friends you know have been have have been killed or died you know I lost count. You know, like, I don't even know. I've just lost, lost count, like way too many to count. <laughs> just, um, just the depth of other people's realities that are living side by side by me in the same city. Um, or, you know, or friends coming from war zones and, or in revolutions and the depth of loss of life. And, and how do I be, be a, a friend and talk about my life and share myself as a human when my ex lived experience is just like, you know, I might be stressed because, you know, my car broke down or some, you know, whatever, some problem. My partner was rude or, you know, my boss was rude. And, you know, my, you know, my friend is, is sad because nobody remembered that it was the anniversary of their, be their like best friend's death in the war and like, they can't sleep and eat. And, like, like, how do I, you know, I have to go through the process in my head of thinking like, you know, how do I show up and relate and be an authentic person? 
Um, what, what does this person want from me? What do they need from me? What do I have to offer them? Like, mm. is it just to sit there and, and let somebody process pain, um, support, give material, you know, resources? Do that, you know, do, do I, I have to make sure I'm not like trying to solve their problem with my white solutions? Have you tried therapy? Have you tried meditation? Mm-hmm. Have you tried yoga? Have you tried herbs? <laughs> Like, you know, all we the things know. that I tried. Because you actually, you got me into herbs because I was thinking about when we were living together at first, I was having terrible panic attacks, like all day life consuming panic attacks um, that nobody, they were totally masked. Like nobody could tell, but they were just happening all the time. And I was thinking about getting on anxiety meds of some kind. And you were like, have you ever fucked with kava? Mm-hmm. And I was like, no, but that sounds like some expensive ass fuckery. And you got me kava and you supplied my kava for a long <laughs> time until I was trying my own. Yeah. 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 But, I mean, herbs are, herbs are great, but like also not everybody's in a space where they really want to hear about herbs right then. And like, you know, sometimes, sometimes they are, and sometimes they are. are. You know, it's kind of arrogant of me to, if I don't have the funds to help somebody with that, to just be like, have you tried herbs? Yeah, it's $50 a bottle. But, um, yeah, I hadn't really thought about you don't have the money for that shit. Sorry. I mean, I've done that kind of thing a lot with friends, you know, where I've tried to float a a suggestion. And then I realized that it's something like vastly inaccessible to them. And, you know, I want to kick myself. And But I just, you know, a lot of times I think white people will just shut down and privileged people will just shut down and like not want to be friends with that person anymore because, oh, I feel bad. I might've made them feel bad. I'll just pull back. And like, I did that. I've done that. I've seen myself do that, you know, cause you don't want to be the person who's hurting the other person. Um, but like, then you, it's really, you're just repeating white supremacy because then you're just another white person who's like self isolating from, people different from you and cause you're getting in, in your, cause you're worrying about your own self and your own, you know, fragility and your ego. And then like, yeah, they'll let you know, like, or try, you know, try to read between the lines, like read, you know, read people's communication. If you're hurting them, like, and you can ask people don't take up hell space, like probing into their you know state, but like, just God, just have a regular human like relationship. And this is the kind of stuff I've having to tell myself, you know, over, over time. Um, like don't psych myself out and get all weird and like, okay, so here was a, here was an example. Um, like we were, I started this queer house, communal house, and it was in a, in the hood in Oakland. And it was all like white people at first, like white, white, queers. Um, and then I realized like, Oh God, we're being gentrifiers. We should get more people of color in here. Um, so we mm-hmm. having a few, trying to get a few people of color in the house and like, you know, we're like strategizing, well, how do we get more people of color? How do we get actual like black people? Cause this is a <laughs> like black neighborhood. <laughs> and then we're like looking around at each other awkwardly, like, is this racist? Like, <laughs> is it like this- <laughs> <laughs> Where do we start? <laughs> like, Wait, okay? How, how <laughs> long was that conversation was it before I showed the fuck up? Uh, I think that was the, pro- the the conversation that went into the ad that brought you. <laughs> I knew it. I knew it because I showed up and I was like, this is low-key. Oh, racist <laughs> ass. I, was, I love it here. I'm trying to get more people of color. Of course, we were like, you know... <laughs> But, um, but like I talked to my partner at the time who was black and from that neighborhood area and or neighboring area or whatever, and was like, uh, well, fuck it. You got to start somewhere. Why are you getting so up in how you're in appearances? All right. So what if that person, if somebody feels tokenized, then, you know, they don't have to move in, but you got to start somewhere. Stop getting caught up in this stupid like appearances bullshit and just like start offering spots to black people. <laughs> right. Um, but there was a lot of hand wringing, you know, and like, are we going to be, are you doing it right? Are we doing it wrong? Are we going to tokenize or just what are we tokenizing if we do this, but are we being exclusive? We, if we do that and like, you know, like we just overthink anxiety. our analysis and anxiety is a useful tool. If, if people use it like a, tool but it's like a chainsaw 
that yeah, just we, wrecks we, on we on its own. In action, we don't act. Like we just get frozen and just stuck, and it makes us uncomfortable, and we just stop and then just back off and just do something else. <laughs> like just don't yeah. lean into it and just lean away and like shrink back and tuck our tails and like, go back among people that we feel more comfortable around that don't make us feel that way. But I genuinely I, feel like it's helpful in life to consider spiritual armor, to just think yeah. of things as potentially spiritual warfare or like some kind of field of play in that fashion. Yeah. Like, if it's not uncomfortable, it's not, you're, you're not doing it right. And like people say that and they think they know what that means, but then when they get really uncomfortable, they're like, no, no, this is too uncomfortable. This is too uncomfortable. <laughs> right. You know? And Okay. Like it's too uncomfortable for a little while. Okay. Like, okay. Tap out and come back though. Like tap out and come back though. Do the, you know, do some thinking about it and like, like, and stop and make, make the harm better and stop doing the harm and, um, and put a smile on your fucking face. Cause you learned a lesson and you're not going to be that asshole anymore. Thank goodness. Like hopefully, you know, like <laughs> cognitive behavioral therapy for myself, you know, like telling myself like, no, it's not, I'm thinking of it like that, but it's not really, that's not really, that's distorted thinking. Like, it's not really like that. Like, <laughs> Think of it like this instead and just have to keep mm. changing my, my lens on things and being like, hmm, what would my friends that have taught me a bunch of stuff about the world think about this? Hmm, let me, because I can do that now. I've gotten enough, like, I mean, I can't say I can do it perfectly, but I can, I can be like, hmm, what would my friend so-and-so, what would my ex so-and-so, what would my, you know, former housemate so-and-so say about that? Hmm, well, let me think about it. So, okay, let me give a situation where that came into play. Um, last summer, the protests were going on and um, uh, somebody in my employ was like, uh, you know, I want to go support, but I then can't come safely into your home because I might be exposed to COVID, but I want to go do this. I understand if you're not, you, uh, if you're not going to pay, if you, you know, if you don't pay me, uh, for that time, um, for it while I have to stay away. And then I was like, Hmm, let me think about that. And I thought, Ooh, and my gut reaction was like, my greedy white reaction was like, Ooh, here's a good opportunity to save 500 bucks. <laughs> <laughs> And then I was like, what would, what would you have said? What, what would my, oh. said? what would so-and-so have said? Like, uh, look at me with a, like a, a deadpan, like idiot face and be like, are you serious? Pay, pay her, <laughs> let her go. Oh, to the yeah. Place. I have consternation <laughs> face right <laughs> now at the notion <laughs> I know, right? I was and it yeah. took about like twenty minutes to think about it, and then I was like, "No, I I know better. I know better. I learned better. Don't be that bitch. Mm-hmm. Don't be that bitch. Don't be that white bitch. Don't don't you know better? Who? What are you thinking? Who are you? Mm-hmm. <laughs> How strong are your convictions? How deep are your convictions, Rebecca? Um, did you mean it when you said all those things? So yeah. Mm-hmm. Uh, and then, you know, I did the right thing and then I felt better. <laughs> like white guilt can, you know, the people always want to like, like white racists want to mock white activists, white anti-racist activists. Like, oh, you just have white guilt. You just have white guilt. And I've, I've just have to keep coming back to again and again. It's like, you know, we should be fucking guilty for what we did. It's horrible. And what we do, we do horrible things. I mean, we did horrible things and the problem is when we get hung up on it and we can't move past it. And it's all about our egos and we just, God, it's really, that's really what a lot of what the problem is. We just get really hung up on, on appearances, on our egos and being embarrassed because we've tried so hard to be the good white people. And then all of a sudden we're the bad white people. <laughs> it's, embarrassing. it's so embarrassing. shift. <laughs> <laughs> And there's very few times in life when I have to deal with embarrassment like that anymore. I, I had to come out of being a fundamental, <laughs> fundamentalist, evangel- evangelical, <laughs> like I, I had to come back. I still have to, I just said it to like a world of people. That's actually the first time I've said <laughs> on this podcast. Yeah. Like I wasn't going to just put your finger on it. But 
Yeah, I mean, why the fuck not? That's what I was doing with the weird cult I was in, was proselytizing the gospel as a fucking name. So I don't really, I think I just maybe don't have room for people's weird embarrassment shit, you know? I was a teenager for that shit, too. And you shouldn't. No, it's, 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 it's appalling when you think about it. And, you know, like, I just, I... I force myself to scroll Facebook and, and, and be reminded of like images of genocide and, and slaughter. Cause I'm like, I'm like, yeah, get out of touch. <laughs> and I got to get back in touch with reality here. I'm getting wrapped up in my white nonsense. And, um, it's so easy to just go off into la la land and, and just go, just think about comfortable things. We set it up so that it's really yeah. easy to, I have a lot of people that come at me, uh, with concern, quote unquote, they're concerned about me. I don't know what that means in general, but they are concerned about me when they say that I need to throttle like all information like that, like looking up, you know, just knowing what, and I don't, I don't binge eat it, but I don't know how people are supposed to get calibrated to what's actually happening. If you don't look at this stuff. There's a thing that I saw last summer that called spiritual bypassing that made me really think um, it's a type of, of a white uh, fragility that's like, I'm too sensitive a soul to watch the news and I'm too sensitive a soul to hear about these horrible things. Um, and so I'm just going to, I absolve myself from having to engage with it. And I've been guilty of that. Like, I mean, to a certain extent, yeah, sure. We, like, we're all, you know, human. We have to maintain our psychological health and we can't be, you know, doom scrolling 24 seven because it's, it's going to burn every anybody out. But like, you can't just stick your head in the sand either. And like, I, you know, I've been guilty of, I feel like, like I was saying, like stepping away for too long and not looking at it for too long like literally not looking at Facebook for too long. I mean, fuck Facebook, but that's where I get my dose of reality. Um, mm. I'm, I'm a, I'm a silly jerk, but, um, there's other places to get content, but Facebook and Instagram have taken up. I don't know that it's that people are actually going to Facebook as it is that Facebook has moved into them and possessed them as a community and in order to be part of community properly, you kind of have to just deal with the Facebook of it all. Mm -hmm. I don't know. The question you kind of started off with a while back about being mean to people on social media, quote unquote, and like the fallout from that and the interaction that I had, those kind of interactions that I had with the mom or those various people, like the, the, the former you know, high school classmate person, those people might have shut down and not listened to me, but that stuff might work on them, you know, on some level deep down, it may or may not, they may feel shame burn. And I mean, I know they're, they're religious people and they may have some like, actual depth of conviction. They may actually, you know, confront some stuff, but that's, but if, even if they don't, other people came to me that out of the woodwork that like barely knew me, you know, these days or knew me from way back in the day or barely knew me at all, but were just from my hometown and just like added me as friends and wanted to chat and like, we thought that was cool. And we're like, yeah, don't stress about that. <laughs> you are right. You know, <laughs> that was, was, that was awesome. You know, and, and it's, like diversity of tactics, man, that stuff, it turns some people off, but it turns some people the fuck on. It, 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 it shakes people to the core sometimes. Like it took me, it took some graphic realizations to get me to awaken to the reality of things. Like I went through all of a PhD program, um, then learning about oppression and didn't understand really jack shit about it until I started like seeing it up front in my face and like, um, being confronted with uncomfortable and, beyond, um, situations. Um, but yeah, like I think, you know, it, I've, t okay. So my own grandma, my own grandmother, my only living grandparent is now no longer my Facebook friend because I lashed out at her about some like, you know, thin blue line type of nonsense. Um, and was, oh my. I like, I wasn't even like, I wasn't, abusive. I was like, 
I said, this is racist. And I said, I'm, I, I, I hate that you would post something like that and that you would have that hate in your heart. And don't you understand, you know, why this is wrong, yada, yada, a few things. And this is not what the, the values that you t- taught me and that I learned in Sunday school with you when I was a little kid and Jesus and, you know, and love and, um, and, and justice. And she blocked me. Mm. Um, and she's like, well, you know, yeah. late nineties, maybe, I don't know. She's way up there like, and in Kentucky and like probably will never see me again. Like maybe, you know, I was ready to just get that relationship off because I was, and then my aunt, I saw like, I have Facebook purity so I can tell when people un- unfriend me and my aunt believed me too. <laughs> like I was just like, mm. Wow this the fragility to cut off your own grandchild because they called you out publicly on Facebook about something that was racist in a loving but firm way like mm. reading into the lines that I'm like calling them horrible names and like calling them a shit human being that doesn't deserve to live or something like they act like it i mean they act like it like being called racist is being called <laughs> Just like, like they think racist means KKK N word shouting. Yeah. And how I mean, dare they be associated? The, the thing with like oppressor types is they don't like being called the thing that they would just be if they were just a demographic or something. Yeah. Like, but I just like, I, since we were just talking about Facebook and the prevalence of them, uh, Good Morning Mayberry does not have a store presence on Facebook or Instagram. Uh, Not for lack of trying. I spent many hours putting it together, but we've been rejected from the storefront because we do not fit into their community standards. And the only designs I have on there are also available on our store. Uh, And it's just marginalized centrists is the only thing besides the Good Morning Mayberry logo available on anything. But somehow I got a sense. I was like, I feel like Facebook is completely occupied by centrists. That's the entire, you know, at least 99.99% of the staff. Um, And they're probably seeing the word marginalized to mean murder because that's what they're okay with. (laughs) <laughs> you know we gotta kind of wrap things up like ryan has been chilling here while we've been i i asked him to join us because we just have such bizarre and interesting conversations about this stuff uh yeah sorry i didn't speak up a little bit more i just wanted to hold space for this conversation like because there was a lot to process and move and unpack here and also i know you guys have a history so I was also gathering context clues um, based on uh, what was shared. And I've, I've also taken notice that like anti-racism is trending and people are excited about the ways they can promote themselves that way. Uh, if they, there's, a, there's a fear of missing out when the climate is charged and the cool people are, uh, it's, it's kind of, it's sensationalized. It's, when, when FOMO is applied at all to situations that involve real experiences and like death, I, cause a lot of the time there's so much to be talking about that it gets, it just gets convoluted. Like the whole conversation goes wherever anybody wants to drag it. But the bottom line is, is like at all times I'm contending with this issue where like my fear of actually being killed has to be in contest with somebody's mood because they're there because they feel sad or bummed about not having a story to tell and not having an involvement that I don't know. They get, I'm flashing to uh, the boondocks episode where they get into it with granddad about whether or not he was actually there getting hosed down by fire hoses and chased um, by dogs. Yes. Yeah. People just need to show up, but then also they need to get out of the way. But then also it's a lot of nuance to juggle, and I don't know what to say. They, they want to be able uh, – they need to be able to, when they're asked about it in the future, they don't want to tell a story where they weren't in the middle of it all um, mm-hmm. doing what history will see as the right thing. Mm-hmm. But in the moment, they want to find the easiest way to do it, the most mm-hmm. common way to do it. Yes. Yep. 
That was it. So when you ask granddad what he was doing, he'll tell you he was actually sitting next to Rosa Parks and he started a fight with the bus driver and, uh, and his dick was better than Martin Luther King's and, (laughs) and, you know, he, he goes ham and that's when Kiwi and Riley are like, yeah, I don't fucking think so. Right. Yeah. Cause that's, I mean, when they try to make up an experience, Either to project, you know, or like, I think the dip, I think the distinction, like the thing that works or doesn't work. And this is something that people have different levels of bandwidth to apply or not. It's not something that like some people are better at it inherently than others, but it tends to fluctuate in all of us. But being able to just be willing to, to like hear about your bullshit and adapt. I took drums from this dude that had this one tip that I've applied universally in a bunch of different ways in my life. Uh, If you're going to make a mistake, make it loud so you know what you did wrong. And that's cool so long as you're in a space where you're like, I'm in class mode and I'm a student. And when I make a mistake, I'm going to learn from that. There's like a tarp down to just grab up the mess. Like there's mats on the floor. Yeah, yeah, have the room prepared a bit. That's that spiritual warfare concept. Like, you just kind of psychologically consider what kind of mess is going to happen and account for that and try to talk about it, communicate that shit. We're working with data. Stay in a stay in a space of, like, a, adaptability and heal as needed but like i don't i don't know how we're we're gonna have to do a whole episode addressing white people and self-care like it's not self-care they skin self-care they hang it up and they rip its skin off and they wear it when they are really ally fatigue coming on too soon ally fatigue is always too soon i'm gonna just say it like that it's always too soon Anyway, I don't know. We'll we'll be coming back to all of this subject matter in so many other episodes. But I feel like um, the conclusion is that white fragility is a personality disorder, but that there are lots of treatment potentials that mostly involve just, like, not being a dick. (laughs) (laughs) Yeah. Well said. (laughs) Just trying to, you know, summarize everything. Basic human decency and respect kind of stuff, yeah. We'd like to thank our patrons on Patreon and everyone who's bought our merchandise. Find the links to all that stuff and our social links on goodmorningmayberry.com. We've got closed captioned episodes on YouTube. Subscribe, listen, and rate us on all the podcast spots. If you're wondering who we are, we is me and my demons. And you can join the Legion by following our Tumblr, Twitter, or Instagram, jumping on the Patreon, or just buying one of our shirts and wearing that around, drinking the tears of whoever you like the least uh, out of one of our mugs. And uh, coming back and checking out the next episode. I'm Shift. And always remember to never forget. When you ask Granddad what he was doing, he'll tell you he was actually sitting next to Rosa Parks and he started a fight with the bus driver and his dick was better than Martin Luther King's. And, <laughs> and you know, he goes ham. And that's when Kiwi and Riley are like, Yeah, I don't fucking think so. Right.